Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The main organ of cognizance within our being is our mind. And our mind is constructed of the elements. And our mind functions in dealing with the elements. So we have input through our senses and that input registers in our mind and the mind reacts in an elemental way. So when we speak about things that are other than an elemental, when we talk about that which is transcendent, the mind doesn't grasp these things and the mind can't deal with these things because the mind deals with that which is part of this world of illusion. The mind itself functions in illusion. And functioning in illusion puts us in a situation where we, each of us individually, has to understand that our comprehension of reality is limited. It's limited because we are trying to define, explain reality using our knowledge of the illusory world and of the elemental world. And the illusory world and the elemental world cannot explain reality. In Christianity, there is the image of Christ walking on water. And one of the explanations is that he is walking on the ocean of illusion. He is still within it, but also above it. So there's a transcendence above illusion. Let us look at the mind and how it functions. The mind came to us through desire. Desire became illusion and illusion became the mind. Now, since desire is at the beginning of the formation of the mind, we need to understand that the mind always wants something. The mind is always looking to gain something. The mind is always looking for self-interest. The mind is always looking to acquire. And in order for us to be able to understand the nature of reality, we have to go beyond that tendency of the mind. And it's more than a tendency. It's, almost, it's at the root of the way that the mind acts. It's at the root of the way our egocentric self acts. People talk about love and how 
they have given themselves up to love and how they've done so much on behalf of love or for love. And there's always the, uh, the one who's entranced by the other and they give everything they have expecting something in return. And when that return doesn't come, there's incredible disappointment. How can we give so much love and yet not get love in return? Well, when we look at things that way, love is a commodity. You expect to be able to get love because you give love. And this is part of the nature of the mind. This is still dealing with the world of illusion. In order to be able to transcend the mind and to transcend the connection to that which is elemental, we need to begin with unconditional love. And unconditional love is not something that's easy to understand and or easy to become involved with, but that's our cure. That's the beginning of the path towards finding reality, the ability to love unconditionally. Now, mothers are able to do this with their babies. They give everything they have on behalf of the child. And that's why that period when they're raising their child as an infant, mothers are in a different state. And you can sense the glow that comes from them when they are in that state of unconditional love. Now, the reason unconditional love is so important for us to understand and for us to integrate into our being is because unconditional love is our escape from illusion. It's our escape from the mind. It's acting in a way that the mind doesn't act on its own, which means we have somehow brought up an intention from within ourselves to counteract that which the mind is doing and doing to us all the time. The mind gives us ridiculous answers to things at times. And even scientists give us ridiculous answers to things at times. And why is that? It has to do with the egocentric assertion that we are capable of knowing and depending on who we are, that assertion spans the universes and tries to tell us that we can or will shortly know everything. And knowing everything is beyond the mind's capability. It can't and won't do that, but the arrogance that buttresses the mind will convince man that in fact he can know everything. So there's a, a story that Bawa told over and over about the scientific method and the fact that man comes to conclusions that are other than valid. It's the jump frog jump story. 
And uh, all of us who've been around Bauer certainly know this story. For those of you who don't, uh, a scientist put a frog down on the ground and slammed the ruler in front of it and screamed jump. And the frog jumped and he measured the distance of the jump and the jump was four meters. Then he cut one leg off the frog and screamed jump again. The frog jumped and jumped three meters. He cut another leg off the frog and said, jump frog. And the, the frog jumped a meter and a half. Then he began to cut the back legs off. And now he's down to three legs and he cried, jump frog, jump. And the frog jumped about eight inches. Then he cut the fourth leg off and he screamed, jump frog, jump. And the frog wouldn't jump. So he finally writes down, frog with four legs goes deaf. And this is the way men interpret scientific facts. This is the way men come to conclusions. They have to come to conclusions, but it doesn't mean that there's any validity to the conclusion. It's like the ostrich. When the ostrich gets too tired to run from whoever's chasing it, the ostrich puts its head in the ground and thinks it's hidden. And not only is it not hidden, it is now in tremendous danger. So what is the solution to this mind dilemma? And what is the way out? One, we have to recognize the mind's limitations and recognize that what it's telling us is at best only partially true. But then we have to recognize that to get beyond this, we have to surrender. Since we can't do the work that takes us to transcendence through the mind, we have to surrender. Surrender what? Surrender to whom? How do we surrender? And this is where faith comes in. We have to believe that even though we have been given limited knowledge, reality will be introduced to us over time and we will come to know that which it is that we have to know. But to understand that, we also have to understand the nature of our existence. And the nature of our existence is such that there is a trajectory to our existence that is beyond that which we can presently comprehend. Yet, we have been told by the prophets, by the holy ones, by the ones with divine knowledge, that there is more to this existence than this span we call life. And this span within this body. The great poet Rumi used to refer to death as the changing of his shirt. In other words, it was time to take on a different form. And that form is a formless form, a form without the elemental manifest body that we see, a form that is without form in the way that qualities are without form, yet we can be very cognizant of their existence and of their power within existence. When we have a relationship with somebody, and we expect tit for tat 
We expect things to be done for us when we do things for others. There's one kind of relationship. When we enter into unconditional love and we give love, but don't expect love, don't expect anything, the relationship changes and we enter into a different kind of relationship. Now, until we learn how to love and or give con unconditional love, we are relegated to a life within the concepts and constructs that are within the mind, the illusory world. When we were with our sheikh, one of the things that happened to us is that we were able to be loved while we didn't yet know or understand what true love was, while we didn't yet know or comprehend what unconditional love was, while we didn't yet comprehend why we needed unconditional love. We are in an evolutionary process in the way that we are going from this manifestation to the next manifestation, which is a formless manifestation. And in truth, this path that we are going on, this straight path that we ask to be taken on is the path towards understanding reality. And what is reality? God is reality. So it's this path towards understanding what God is, to understanding the nature of what God is. And how can we understand the nature of what God is? By assuming that nature, by becoming that which we are trying to comprehend. We cannot comprehend that which we are not. You can't speak a foreign language until you learn the foreign language. And all of the sounds that are made with that foreign language are non-sensible to you. They're just noise. But to someone who speaks that language, there's an entire understanding that comes with each one of those sounds. It's like that with the qualities of reality. Until you know them, they don't mean anything to you. They're sounds without comprehension. They're sounds without meaning. They're sounds without reality. So to say the word compassion, well, we can all define it and we can all tell everybody else what it means, but until we reach a state of compassion, we do not comprehend compassion. And that's why we need to be able to understand things that are beyond the mind's understanding. But to enter into that realm where you understand beyond what the mind understands, you have to set forth an intention within you to do that. So we need to create an intention within us to become wise. And one of the mainstays of wisdom, 
one of the pillars of wisdom is that it is not attached to self motive. It is not attached to needing things for ourself. It's not attached to desire. The mind has come from desire. So we need to now comprehend things from a place that isn't attached to desire. And by comprehending things from a place that isn't attached to desire, we can begin to understand reality. Unconditional love isn't attached to desire because it's not expecting something. So we need to create an entire new way of seeing things, an entire new way of understanding ourselves and the world that we live in. And if we can create an understanding that isn't attached to desire, then we'll lose our attachment to illusion. We'll lose our attachment to the mind. We'll lose our attachment to the act that we put on in this world to fulfill our desires. We can let go of the act because we no longer are driven by the egocentric need for things, for things constantly. We're also, once we enter into unconditional love, lose the attachment to the mind's constant projection into the world of how things should be, how things should go on, and how people should react. It's very interesting. So many people go through this world depending on how other people react to them and trying to induce other people to react to them in certain ways. But once you understand that these people are driven by mind and desire, that these people are caught in the midst of illusion, what difference does it make how other people react to you? Does it set forth who you truly are? Or is who you truly are the core of your being and the core of your nature and the core of the nature that you've established? Did everyone love Jesus? Did everyone love Muhammad? Did everyone love Moses? To the contrary, they tried to kill Muhammad. They tried to kill Jesus. They tried to kill Moses. This is the way it was, even for the prophets. So if you're looking for love in the world, you will be terribly disappointed. And you will be chasing goals that are unreachable you will be chasing situations that are outside of what can actually be obtained. The dervish was walking down the street and somebody asked him for directions and he gave them the directions. And the man turned to him and said, oh, thank you, my sheikh. And all of a sudden he thought, he recognizes who I really am. He recognizes that I'm much more than what appears to the eye. And the dervish walked a little further and he saw the man stop and talk to somebody else. And he didn't hear the whole conversation. But at the end of the conversation, he heard the man say, oh, thank you, my sheikh. And he began to realize that he was telling everybody, thank you, my sheikh. 
And he went back, the dervish went back and explained what had just happened to him uh, to his own sheikh. And his sheikh said, well, it's interesting. The man, either one, was trying uh, to make you feel better about yourself and was trying to butter you up for what you had done to him, or he recognized the king inside of everybody and was truly selfless and was able to call everybody his sheikh because he saw the God in everyone that he met. But you, still stuck in separation, thought that when he was calling you sheikh, it was to the exclusion of everyone else. This is how we react in the world. This is how things go on. And we have to lose this attachment to ourselves. We have to lose this attachment to this being that we have created through the illusion that is projected from all of the hypnotisms and magnetisms and sparkles within the mind that create this image of the world and this image of who we are. You know, the mind does funny things. It constantly creates arguments that we always win. It constantly creates scenarios that we always come on top of. It constantly creates situations that we are the victor of. And then we try and put those same situations into the world and wrestle with other people so that we come to the same conclusions that we want to come to, which are egocentric, self-centered, based. Bauer talked about the great sin of separation, the sin that tells us that we are all different than each other the sin that equates people and puts them in their places, some lower, some higher, some in between, with ourselves usually at the top of this equation. Countries have gone to great lengths to institute these systems. Some people call it apartheid. Some people call it a caste system. Some people call it religious differences. Some people call it racism. There are all kinds of names for this sin of separation. But we should understand that this sin of separation exists within people who are the same. Do you think in a country like Japan, where they're mostly homogeneous and they're mostly all one race, the sin of separation doesn't exist? Do you think all of them treat each other exactly the same? No, they've set up castes. They've set up different ideas of where people are in relationship to each other. The whole world establishes hierarchies of relationships to each other. In America, we call some people stars, and we, come so, we call some people luminaries, and we call some people icons to try and differentiate between that which is normative and that which has exceeded the normative, as if man within this illusory world can somehow exceed the normative, can somehow be more than other man. And we set criteria for what that is. And think about how absurd the criteria is how many magazine covers have you been on is an establishment of the criteria of how important 
you are. How many dollars do you own? It sets an establishment of criteria of how important you are. How many people have been able to view your face in the cinema? It sets a criteria of how important you are. The world has set all kinds of criteria to help us stay within the sin of separation, to help us stay within the area where we do not understand the unity of existence. Satan has done a very good job of spreading the lies of the I, the lies of the importance of the I, the lies of the fact that we are somehow different and somehow separated. Religions do it, countries do it, races do it. Everybody does it. And everybody does it for what they consider very, very good reasoning. No matter how much we do it, no matter how much we try to get a step ahead in this world of everybody else, it's of no consequence. Somebody asked Nasruddin, can you tell me how big the world is and what there is to see in it? And a funeral was passing by at the second. And he said, go ask that man that they're carrying. He's seen it all and he's leaving. He'll probably have a better idea than I do. And this is what it's like. We are all headed towards the same end. Interestingly, we all came from the same beginning in the same way, and we are all headed towards the same end. And we all know this. And we think that what goes on in between differentiates us from each other. Well, in truth, there is a differentiation. And that differentiation is either you understand the unity of existence and become part of it, or you continue to call yourself separate. That's what differentiates us. And the ones of us who understand the unity in existence and can treat all others equally and can see ourselves as being with everyone else, they are the ones who will understand the truth of reality and the truth of God. They are the ones who love unconditionally. They are the ones who have intended to become real. Hak is one of the names of God. Hak means reality. We need to comprehend that reality, not the various realities that exist within this world. The thing that's real, if you go to Mongolia, is much different than the thing that's real that if you're in a Polynesian island. Everybody has their own idea of what reality is and what, important, what importance is. But there's only one reality, and that's God's reality. And it's the same for the man in a rocket ship as the man riding on a camel in the desert. Our reality is connected to Allah. And to understand and comprehend the nature of Allah is how we will comprehend the nature of reality and we will comprehend the reality of who we are. So how do we get to know ourselves? We get to know the Lord within us. How do we get to know the Lord within us? To give up our sin of separation 
and to give up the to give up the need to differentiate ourselves from others and to find the commonality that exists within all beings. And that commonality that exists within all beings is their connection to our creator and the connection to understanding the nature of our creator because the creator was the same for everyone. There is but one creator and he created all of us, and he gave us all the aptitude to come to know him. And when that knowledge becomes the most important thing in our intentions, that's when we become reality. That's when we become real. That's when we begin to understand the true nature of existence. So in our prayers, this is what we have to pray for, that we become real, that we become those who intend to understand the truth. And then when the truth is shown to us, we can't turn away from it because it doesn't meet our imagination. The truth is going to be so much different than what the mind tells you, that there comes a time when you have to make a choice, go with the truth or go with your mind. And if you go with your mind, you are heading towards illusion. If you go with the truth, you are finding your way towards the straight path. When people, when the prophet came to people, some turned from him, some went with him. When the Ketubs come to people, some turn from him and some go towards him. The saint walks into a town carrying a flame. Some come with bellows and some come with buckets of water. And it's like that. Some people want to put out the truth because it's too much for them to handle. And some want to jump into the truth. We have to ask Allah to make us the ones that want to jump into the truth. We have to ask Allah to make us the ones who desire the truth more than we desire illusion. And this is the crux. This is the big decision. Can we love unconditionally, or are we still looking for illusory rewards? Can we give unconditionally, or are we still looking for illusory rewards? Allah's treasures are greater than any treasures in this world. To know the truth of mercy, to know the nature of compassion, to know the nature of true justice, to know the nature of unconditional love is a transcendent glory that is beyond your mind's imagination. And as long as we're caught in our mind's imagination, we are never going to reach the true glory that is available to us. May Allah suspend illusion for us and may the truth be what we yearn for and may be the truth be what we're given. Amin, amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.